Roses have a reputation for being difficult to grow, but our speaker tonight is going to tell us how it's done. Don Kinsler is a native of Lisbon, North Dakota, and after graduating from North Dakota State University in horticulture, Don joined the NDSU Experiment Station in Woody Plant Research, followed by five years in Extension Horticulture's state office. After he left NDSU, Don and his wife Mary owned and operated a greenhouse business for the next 25 years. Wow. So he's a lot of experience. Don's now back with NDSU, which we're all happy about, and he's the extension agent for Cass County Horticulture. Don writes two weekly gardening columns for foreign communications, and he has a weekly radio program on two stations during the growing season. Don, welcome to the forums. Well, good evening. Good evening. And thank you very much for inviting me. Now, I'm excited. Now, I, I like everything in horticulture, all the way from houseplants to vegetable gardening and everything in between, and not the least of which is growing roses. So this evening, it's going to be fun to discuss roses. Now, I have... Um, I have uh, grouped rose growing into about 10 steps, and I firmly believe that all of us can grow roses. Now, for example, the roses that you see pictured there are all Canadian developed, very winter hardy types. Now, one thing I should mention, um, feel free to at some point to download the handout that was prepared on uh, growing roses in the upper midwest because everything i say uh, during this program is written up on there so feel free just to sit back and enjoy the show and know that everything that i mention uh, as well as a list of the hardiest roses are all on that handout but look at the variety of roses that can be grown. Uh, starting from the left is Hope for Humanity, a beautiful called Campfire is next. Uh, the upper right hand is one of my favorite called Canada Blooms. And the lower right is uh, Morden Sunrise. So just look at the variety of very winter hardy roses that we can grow. So if we are looking at having rose success in a northern atmosphere or northern environment like we have, there are really 10 steps. It's a 10 step process. So let, let's cover those 10 steps and then I think we can all be highly successful. Now it, it's fun, my wife Mary and I have, uh, well, I think probably about 15 rose bushes in our yard and they're, they're wonderful. So step number one is to choose the varieties wisely. Now the International Rose Society groups roses into uh, very strict classifications traditionally. Uh, starting from the left, you have hybrid teas with the beautiful kind of florist quality blossoms. And then you have the floribundas, grandifloras, hybrid mu musk, uh, miniature roses, climbing roses, tree roses, wild roses, shrub roses, and a few other classifications. But a maybe better way to classify roses is by winter hardiness. Uh, that is really the most useful because in our area, of course, we're all about having our roses survive the winter time. So I've grouped the roses into kind of three categories based on that winter hardiness. Uh, and we'll go through each of these in a little more detail. But first of all, are roses that are really quite winter hardy and they will survive our uh, northern conditions here even without winter protection. Uh, you know, we'll see, they might get a little, uh, little bit of winter injury on the tops, but they'll come through fine. And many of those were developed in Canada, uh, hardy Canadian shrub roses. Now, a second classification of winter hardiness is what we could call crown hardy. Now, crown hardy roses are uh, ones where the canes, the rose branches, often die back to the ground. Uh, now, they can regrow from the base, but those are really best covered for winter. A uh, third hardiness classification are roses that we would consider tender. And those freeze out very, very easily. So winter protection on those is a must. And we'll talk about winter protection in a little bit. 
So let's talk about each of these winter hardiness categories. Let, let's start with the last one first. Uh, the, the tender roses, uh, several types, like if you're looking through a garden catalog or you're looking at tags in a garden center, you'll oftentimes see these terms. Now, hybrid tea, those are the really nice, look like florist roses. That particular one uh, pictured there uh, is the peace rose. Uh, that is one of my favorite. Um, now, these tender type roses, if you're a hobby rose grower, you know, these are kind of must haves. You know, if you kind of like to as a hobby, kind of fuss with roses a bit, then the tender roses, you know, you don't mind covering. Well, Peace Rose is really a, a, a great hybrid tea. And then you see the names like Grandiflora, Florabunda, but these types really need winter protection. Next, we move to those that I mentioned were called crown hardy roses. Uh, now the crown of a rose is the spot between the branches and the roots. That, that spot, that juncture is called the crown. And crown hardy roses will oftentimes have the canes die all the way back down. Uh, and so they really need to be covered. Now, many of the crown hardy roses are the types sold by the national mass merchandisers. Uh, we have to be careful because sometimes on the tag, they'll say hardy. Well, what's hardy down in Kansas isn't necessarily hardy in Fargo, North Dakota. So a series that you oftentimes see in this grouping are ones such as the Easy Elegance series, uh, Oh So Easy, Carefree Beauty, the Knockout Roses. Uh, so do be cautious with these, even though the tag says hardy, they maybe aren't hardy for our area. Uh, they'll oftentimes survive, but they'll die back quite a ways or totally die out if they're not covered. Next, we get to the stars of the show, and these are the winter hardy roses. These are really my favorites because there are so many different colors, and many of these were developed in Canada. Canada has had a very, very good rose breeding program throughout the decades, and I have these listed on the handout. Uh, the Canadian roses are, uh, you, you find them in series, like the Parkland series and the Canadian Artist series, you know, etc. Et uh, just uh, for example, here, uh, starting on the left, are uh, Morden Blush. Uh, one of my favorites is called Canada Blooms. That's the dark pink one. Hope for Humanity is the red one. Uh, Morden Sunrise is that beautiful uh, kind of coppery yellow. And the climbing is William Baffin. So lots of good selection in these types and they will survive winter uh, better than uh, most other roses. In addition to the ones developed in Canada, there are many very good old roses uh, that survive winter fine. Many of these were found on homesteads such as Persian yellow rose, uh, Grutendorst rose, the Hansa rose, those are good too. The ones developed in Canada tend to have a little better flower a um, little better flower form. And many of those bloom recurrently throughout the summer also, instead of just being June bloomers. Now, step number two in our process, and that is to buy what is what are called own root roses, if at all possible. Now, there are two ways to propagate roses commonly, and one is by grafting. And that is where the upper good flowering part is grafted onto a kind of a non-flowering rootstock. And you can tell those by the knobby graft joint in between the branches and the roots. Uh, the other type uh, shown on the right are called own root roses. Uh, own root roses were propagated by cuttings and so the, the cutting of the rose rooted and so it has its own roots. The problem with the grafted roses on the left is that if that upper part totally freezes out, uh, the sprouts that live over and come from the base are just the non-flowering rootstock type thing. You've lost your good flowering. Uh, versus on the right, the own root roses, 
even if the tops die back, any sprigs that come from down below are always going to be that good flowering variety. And uh, good news, I've noticed in catalogs and plant tags, I'm seeing more and more that they specify whether a rose is on its own roots or whether it's grafted. And of course, the own root roses are going to survive better. Uh, they're less apt to be totally frozen out like a grafted rose. So whenever you have the chance, look for what are called own root roses. They're on their own roots instead of on a grafted root stock. Step number three on our journey is the location. Roses will bloom best if they are have full sun for at least six hours. And um, we should avoid hot exposed locations. Roses don't like that. An east exposure is nice because they get the morning sun and then they get shade from the heat of the afternoon and then the flowers tend to last longer. The another uh, important part about location is plant them in a, an area that gets good snow cover. Snow cover is a great natural insulation where we have some of our rose bushes along the sidewalk. When I shovel the sidewalk, I throw the snow onto the rose bushes. Step number four is to amend the soil. Roses don't like heavy baked clay type soil. They like a soil that is very high in organic material. I like the bales of peat moss because you can find it at almost every garden center and you just mix it down in the soil and it, it has a fairly good lasting uh, capacity in the soil. I, I like the baled peat moss for adding or you can use compost. Now, instead of just adding a few handfuls down in the planting hole when you're planting. Instead, work the organic material into the surrounding soil. Uh, you know, kind of get that so that you have a, a an entire soil mass kind of surrounding the rose that's a little more root friendly. Organic matter really makes a big difference. It also gives a moisture holding capacity too. Step number five on our journey is to plant the roses deeply. No matter what the tag says uh, for planting depth, in our area, it's important to plant them deeply enough because the mass of natural soil will give some insulating benefit. And uh, even if the branches die back up above, hopefully there'll be some sprigs of growth that'll come from below the soil. So if it's a grafted rose, uh, then plant that graft knob four inches below soil surface. If it's an own root rose, uh, plant that crown, which is the juncture between uh, branches and roots, plant that, that crown area also four inches below. That's a very important first step in winter protection, other than choosing a good winter hardy variety. Step six on our uh, journey here is to mulch the roses. Uh, roses love the soil cool and moist and a good mulch of an organic type material such as shredded wood product works really, really well. And for weed control, it should be somewhere between three to five inches. It does kind of pack down together. So I would put for weed control, I'd put up to about five inches of wood product mulch. Now that's much more rose friendly than rock mulch. Uh, rock mulch is hot and heavy. It heats up in the summer sun. That's not really what roses like. And it's also heavy and tends to compact the soil. So, um, you know, maybe skip the rock mulch in favor of a nice uh, shredded wood mulch. Step number seven is the summer care that we give to our roses. And a couple of things that we can talk about on summer care. The first is to water the roses properly. Now, roses are thirsty. Uh, they really should have a good soaking during the summer a couple of times a week. It's better to uh, let the water soak just around this on the soil and let it slowly saturate down around the soil instead of sprinkling overhead. And now the, the lady there means well, but she's, she's not watering the best way. And the reason for that is watering above like that, where you get the foliage all wet, uh, tends to spread foliage diseases. So better to water only the soil and keep the foliage dry. Also uh, water in the morning 
uh, and that then any splashing that does occur will dry up more rapidly instead of watering in the evening where uh, the lower leaves could stay more wet. So water in the morning, water only the soil. Second step of summer care is to fertilize. In addition to being thirsty, roses are also uh, hungry. They're considered heavy feeders. And the fertilizer that you give really does have a noticeable effect on roses, increasing the number of blossoms and the size of the blossoms. So starting really in um, oh, April or May, we can apply either a granular type fertilizer or a liquid water soluble type. Now, the granular fertilizers uh, do not have to be a rose type. They can be. You can use a, a, a fertilizer labeled for roses. That's fine. Or it could be a well-balanced type like a 10-10-10 fertilizer. Now, instead of sprinkling the uh, granular fertilizer on top of the rose bush, uh, I might mention you could use a timed slow release also. But instead of sprinkling that um, fertilizer on top of the mulch, I'd rather brush the mulch back a little bit, uh, incorporate the, the granular fertilizer into the top uh, inch or so of soil watered in, and then you make sure that that fertilizer is making its way down into the root system instead of getting lost between the fibers of the mulch. It's also important to discontinue fertilizing by July 4th. That will give roses the opportunity during the last half of the summer to slow down a bit. They'll still produce blossoms because they've got residual nutrients, but uh, they will slow down a bit. They'll become more, um, uh, uh, what's the term I'm trying to think, uh, hardened. They will become more hardened by fall and they will survive winter better. Another thing in the summer care of roses is to deadhead the withered flowers, removing the spent blossoms. And it's best to do that when they just as soon as those flowers have begun to fade. Now it's important to note where we should cut off those spent flowers. Notice in the diagram right below the flower itself, the first rose leaflet is composed of only three, the first rose leaf is composed of only three leaflets there. If we cut the rose off down to that point, the buds that arise after that are usually quite weak. Sometimes they won't even produce a flower. So instead of that, cut down to where you find the first five, five leaflet leaf. See, so you can see by the diagram there, there's five leaflets on there. Sometimes you'll find one that has seven and cut down to that. And then the uh, buds that arise, the new growth that arises from that point will be more vigorous and will also tend to produce a better flower. And we should stop uh, the deadheading by early August. The reason for that is if we leave the flowers on, they'll... Um, usually turn into a rose hip, which is the fruit coming after the flower. And that helps to harden off the roses. So they'll be more, uh, a little more uh, tolerant going into the winter time. So a little more of a, a winterized rose. Now, step number eight is to control insects and diseases. Let's talk about a couple of those. In the uh, upper left-hand corner, there's a couple of things going on there. That yellowing uh, in between the veins with the green veins is very typical of iron deficiency chlorosis on roses. So we would want to treat that, that's a severe case, we would want to treat that with an iron compound labeled for roses. The second thing is very interesting. Notice those kind of neat cutouts in the leaves. Those are made by an interesting uh, insect called the leaf cutter bee. Uh, they cut out those circles and use those for nesting. Now the leaf cutter bee is a pollinator. So I would not apply an insecticide on there. Uh, usually you don't see quite so many holes in the leaves. It uh, doesn't really seem to hurt the rose that much. So when I see some leaf cutter bee activity, I just leave it alone. The roses, roses do fine. Again, usually it's not quite that, that many. Other insects, uh, we've got the uh, rose pear uh, sawfly um, nibbling uh, on the 
uh, on the outer leaf surface there. And we've got the Japanese beetle. Luckily, they aren't too, uh, uh, too, um, too numerous yet in North Dakota because there are tough insects. But if you find insects on your uh, roses, then treat with a product that's labeled for those. And next we go to rose diseases. The two most common rose diseases are black spot and powdery mildew. Now it's important to note that when rose leaves develop these symptoms, those leaves will not revert back to normal no matter what you put on. And so it's important with rose diseases uh, to prevent them at the very first sign uh, of this happening before it starts to spread. So rose diseases is all about prevention. You can, um, you can find some rose varieties as indicated on their labels that are more resistant to diseases. So that's always a good thing. Or you can use uh, some products. And again, when I mention products, it's not to endorse them, but just to give some suggestions. Uh, garden fungicides or rose type fungicides applied when the rose foliage is still healthy is very important. And don't water from on top, as we mentioned before. And you can even find some rose and flower care uh, systemic type products that will be taken up by the rose that can help with insects if you've been bothered with with that as well. Step number nine is winter protection on roses. Now, even some of the hardy Canadian grown shrub roses, there's nothing wrong with uh, giving them some winter protection. Um, in a very severe open winter where you have no snow cover, uh, then they can, they can die back a bit. Uh, usually they come from the lower part just fine. Uh, but all roses, including even the winter hardy ones, uh, benefits from some, uh, some cover. And with the tender roses, or those that are only crown hardy, the winter protection is kind of a must. Now, a couple of ways we can do that. If you notice over on the left-hand side, uh, we can just scoop up the, the wood product mulch that we have on the rose bed, just kind of heap that up around the canes. Then in the spring, uh, early April, when it's time to remove the mulch, just uh, you know, rake that away and put it back around the base of the rose bushes. Or you can do, as shown in the center photograph, you can put uh, wire mesh or chicken wire and put uh, leaves in, that works. And on the right is the good old rose cone. Now, rose cones by themselves usually do not provide enough winter protection. There's too much free air around the rose cane. So instead, if you do want to use rose cones, uh, mound leaves or uh, wood mulch or something up inside that rose cone in order to give a little better protection. Now, number 10, uh, the step is a very important one, and that is pruning in the spring of the year. Uh, well, I think about it, don't prune rose, roses in the fall of the year. Uh, give roses their pruning in the spring. Uh, that's, that, that's the best time. So when we look at uh, rose pruning in the springtime, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Uh, roses love pruning. Pruning stimulates good growth, fresh growth that is more apt to uh, bloom uh, repeatedly and profusely. Pruning really stimulates nice fresh growth capable of better blooming. So what we want to do are two things, uh, cutting the height of the rose back to about 18 or 24 inches. Then the second step in pruning is to eliminate a lot of the weak crisscrossing uh, growth and just eliminate the tangle of canes. If we get air and light in, we, the growth that arises will be more vigorous and you'll get better blooms. Now, sometimes a bit of winter injury helps us prune or know where to prune. In the photo on the left, you can see where the a winter injury has occurred on some of the canes. There is a very sharp demarcation between the black injured cane portion injured by winter and the uninjured portion, which is green. And so there's no choice other than to cut back that black damaged portion down to the point of where you see green. There are a couple of canes there that you see, they're going to have to be taken all the way back near ground level. 
And so sometimes uh, that will help you thin it out too, getting rid of the winter injury. And the basic pruning cut should be an angled cut about a fourth inch above a bud and aim the buds so that they're facing outward. You know, instead of an inward crisscrossing, aim them outward. And here's one of the most important steps of all, and that is to enjoy the roses that you're growing. Now, again, here are uh, varieties developed in Canada. They have a good amount of winter hardiness. You see their Morden blush. That campfire is a neat one. And you find these at garden centers. I should mention too that uh, for these Canadian developed winter hardy roses, oftentimes it's the locally owned independent garden centers where you will find these. You're less apt to find these at the national chains. But look at campfire up there, that beautiful rose. Uh, that's one that Mary and I have growing in our yard and it gives that uh, you know, kind of a, a multiple colored look. Uh, beautiful. And Alexander McKenzie up in the upper right, uh, I mentioned Canada Blooms down in the center with that pink one, a kind of a different name, Canada Blooms. That one, Mary and I like so much because it's got a, a form that's almost like a hybrid tea and it does have some fragrance. Uh, and it has a nice kind of an upright oval shape. We like that one so much, we planted six of that one. And Oscar Peterson, that's just a very small sampling of probably, oh, there are 40 or 50 of those Canadian roses. Now, be sure to download the handout that I prepared uh, that Tom put on the website, because really everything that I said, plus a little more, is on that handout and it lists many of the good varieties. So be sure to download the handout. And thank you. I've got my email address there. Feel free to contact me if you have questions about rose growing. And those in Cass County, feel free to email me about almost anything. So I'll give you a second to jot down that email address, donald.kinsler at ndsu.edu. And this has been a privilege to talk about roses. Now I'm going to uh, stop sharing that and let's see if there are any questions. Okay, Don, we have a few questions. Um, you did, I see we have a couple questions about pruning the winter hardy roses, but you covered that at the end. How about Don, should you know, like with the drought and the lack of snow cover, are you worried about the roses surviving this winter? Well, as I mentioned, roses, roses are thirsty and uh, many parts of the state had a very dry fall. And so hopefully when we were watering evergreens and other landscape plants, hopefully we gave our roses a good watering too. Without that, if they went through winter in dry soil and many parts of the state didn't have much snow cover, so we didn't have that natural insulation. So it could be a tough winter for rose survival. How about, do you recommend a brand of granular fertilizer for roses? No. Um, my favorite fertilizer is actually 101010 10, 10, uh, for everything from vegetable gardens to uh, shrubbery, roses, because uh, you find it at so many stores, uh, garden centers, national chains, and the label tells kind of for strawberries, raspberries, uh, roses, it kind of usually gives an indication as to how many cups to put or portions to put over an area. And so I really like 101010 10 fertilizer. So I don't have a particular brand. Now, uh, the fertilizers that are labeled specifically for roses, because they're kind of fine tuned. And so um, they're good too. But I, I don't have a particular brand, no. Okay. Just pay attention to the numbers, huh? That's more important, right? Not numbers, so it's not- I believe, brand. I like that well-balanced. It gives the leaves some nutrition. It gives yep. the flowers some nutrition and the roots some nutrition. How about uh, with the uh, Friday Therese Bounet? Is that how you say it? Is that a rug rugosa rose? It is, it is. <laughs> Way back when I was a young little horticulturist working at the experiment station, we used to joke that that was uh, Teresa Bugnet, uh, it's, <laughs> but that's right. and yeah, that's that's been around for a long time. That's a pretty rose as well. well that's uh, considered one of the uh, hardier shrub type roses. Well, Don, 
do you remember it when you were just a little young horticulturist? How did you prune that particular variety? Oh, how, how to prune that one? Uh, very similar to uh, the rose pruning that we described. Uh, maybe cut them back by about half and thin out kind of the crisscrossing branches. And that will tend to send up uh, more prolific, vigorous type shoots that will bloom better. So I, I would prune that similar to what a person would the other roses. Oh, you'll do that in springtime. In, in the springtime. Right. Um, springtime is much uh, favored versus fall type pruning. I think fall pruning on roses opens up the canes to desiccation. And uh, I just feel it uh, tenderizes the roses. How about uh, Hansa or Hansa rose? Have you ever oh, grown that? Oh, that's another, yeah. Hansa is that is hardy? Another, and, uh, that's yes, hardy in four. Hansa sure. is one of the good old, I think that's been around since Three. pioneer days. One of the really good winter hardy shrub roses. Again, um, Canada's breeding program uh, kind of took some of the those good mm. old fashioned shrub roses and kind of kicked them up a notch. But yeah, Hansa, uh, Grutendorst, um, the Persian yellow, those are still great. Now, some of those, I, I can't quite remember if Hansa is just a June bloomer or if that repeats. Mm. I can't remember. I don't, I don't know that, but that's a big concern about a lot of those roses. Is there some just of the a, older shrub roses, yeah. some of the older shrub roses bloomed in June and then right. uh, they were a shrub the rest of the summer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very dry outside. When should we start watering our rose bushes? Are they already thirsty? You know, given the 50 mile an hour wind gusts today, I think I would start if we don't get rain uh, shortly, I think I would probably now uh, in Fargo here, a couple inches down, even though it was dry in the fall, there, there's some moisture below an inch or so. So I don't think the roses, uh, for example, in Fargo here, I don't think they're desiccating yet but uh boy in a lot of parts of the so uh, state even if especially if it's a lighter soil i think i'd probably get some moisture and of course rather than frequent light sprinklings a thorough soaking so that we get watered down in uh, is much better than light frequent sprinklings okay so as i suspected you're going to get a lot of questions so we're gonna you're gonna answer your uh Short and sweet. Don. We can do the, we can do the lightning round. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Okay, how about uh, this person's moving this spring? Can they dig up the roses and take them with them? Yes, dig dig yeah. them up before they leaf out. Dig them up, get as much root as you can. Keep moist uh, peat moss around the roots in a bucket, and off you go. Those oh, oh pr pr prune them back by at least half or two thirds. That uh, increases success greatly. So you mentioned the Canadian explorers. Is there a climber that's hardy? Yes, a couple of really good climbers. Uh, William Baffin and Henry Kelsey are a couple of really good. Uh, now, uh, they don't twine around a trellis by themselves. They get really nice, big, long canes, so they look like a climber. But you do need to take twistums or something and, and uh fasten those canes to the trellis, but they work beautifully. I, I had some photos of those, if you noticed, uh, climbing up yeah. a trellis. I agree. How about, are there any of those Canadian roses fragrant? The, uh, one of my favorites is the one I mentioned called Canada Blooms, that pink one, that has fragrance. Um, and of course, they're, they're working on trying to get fragrance in because the hybrid tea roses uh, with a wonderful rose fragrance. Uh, the shrub type roses are a more subtle fragrance, but do try that one called Canada Blooms is the name because that has one of the most fragrant that I've that I, I've ever grown. There's a question about Canada Blooms. How long does a Canada Blooms bush live? How, well, theoretically, it should live forever. forever. No plants live forever, <laughs> but but it has a good, uh, well, let's see. Uh, we've had Canada blooms now for uh, five years. Uh, sometimes I have to prune prune it. Well, you're supposed to prune it back anyway a little bit, but um, but it's, it's done well for us. Uh, are there any roses that will tolerate less than six hours of sun? Not really. Um, the less sun they get, the less blooms they get. They tend to be a little more uh, weak uh, and less less blooms. So I'm, I'm not really, uh, I don't know of any roses that are really more shade tolerant. Yeah. 
How do you prune a climbing rose? Climbing roses, uh, you can um, cut them back, reduce the height a bit. You don't need to go all the way back to 18 to 24 inches. Uh, check for the de any dead wood that winter killed. So anything that's brown or black, cut back to good green. And you can just kind of get, mostly with climbing type roses, get rid of the cluster, you know, thin them out. And, you know, so re remove any blackened winter injury and get rid of some of the cluster, you know, thin out the crisscrossing and get it down to maybe half of the mass. Okay. Are yellow roses more prone to powdery mildew? Well, that could be. I haven't really seen the correlation, but somewhere there's probably a study that's been done on that. I, I, I'm not aware of that correlation. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's doesn't make sense to me. But how about, a, do you have a, a yellow climbing rose that you like? Well, and now, um, you know, climbing roses as a group are, uh, you know, not very hardy. You know, when you look at a rose catalog and there's climbing roses, those generally are not hardy. They keep uh, uh, freezing back. So uh, when we say the Canadian types that kind of act like climbers, William Baff and Hel Hel uh, Henry Kelsey, uh, but, uh, there is, there is one I think listed on our list uh, that I happen to not copy off for myself. Uh, but I believe there might be a yellow climber in that group that, that acts like a climber. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll have to look at that list. So consult the handout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware of any. How about uh, this person gets orange to red spots on the leaves of the plant? Uh, it sounds like rose rust. Um, and uh, so um, if you're bothered by that, make sure that you rake up the foliage in the fall. Uh, that's good sanitation regardless. And um, then if you've, if you've been bothered by that um, in the past, maybe treat proactively with a fungicide. It sounds like a rust type fungus. fungus. If they used a rose cone, when do they remove the cone? Uh, it depends a little bit, you know, how the spring goes, but really protection should be taken off in early April. Uh, if we're going to get frigid, uh, you know, down into the teens, don't go too far with your cover. Maybe put it back on if, uh, if it's forecast down into the teens or approaching 10. Uh, so don't go too far, but we need to start opening those up and get air into the rows by in early April. Don, is that true for uh, just in general when people cover their roses? Like how do they decide when to uncover them? Uh, best time to cover is usually uh, well, how early about November. How about uncover them? When okay. should we uncover them? Uh, yep, cover them up early November. You got to get some cold in. And then uh, really uncover. Uh, as a rule of thumb, it's usually late March, early April. When you start getting warmer weather, uh, you don't want to let the roses start growing or leafing out underneath. So uh, loosen up any mulch or cover so it can get air and sunlight. But if it is going to get frigid again, then you know move it back around. Okay, this person... Uh, is buying roses and it says grade one and a half. What does that mean? Yeah, rose, roses are graded uh, and uh, the uh, top grade, the grade number one will have thicker canes and grow a little more vigorously from the start. Uh, the lower the numbers are graded less. And so, uh, you know, one and a half is probably a pretty decent rose. Um, so uh, it will probably do quite well for you. And the nice thing about bare root roses that you buy, they will usually flower the first season, such as hybrid teas and et cetera. But again, those, those will need winter cover. How about the David Austin roses? David Austin roses aren't winter hardy. They're in the group of tender type roses. They're very pretty, uh, well worth growing if you like to kind of work with roses as a hobby. Uh, but you do need to cover those for the winter with a good mound of uh, mulch, uh, etc. Yeah, they're very fragrant too, huh? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful about, roses. Yes. How about... Uh, Okay, what's your three or four favorite Canadian roses? And we already know about Canada Blooms. Canada Blooms, because it uh, has nice form and has some fragrance to it. Oh, golly, then it's kind of what you, what you favor by color. 
Um, I like the Morden series. There's Morden Centennial, Morden Blush, Blush Pink. That Morden Sunrise is a coppery orange. So the Morden series is really, really good. And uh, you'll see them labeled like that, you know, Morden Sunrise, Morden Amuret, uh, Morden Ruby. Uh, there's a white one. And so there's a little something for everybody in that Morden series. I, I, I like them too because they're, they are hardy, but they really, uh, they're susceptible to disease. Don't you find that? That's a problem. They are. That That's morning. one reason I like the Canada blooms, which is, is right? you know, I keep harping on Canada blooms. That's a fairly new introduction. Some of the newer introductions coming out of Canada have better uh, disease resistance. Canada blooms has a nice glossy green uh, leaf, fairly free of disease. You know what? I'm just going to just uh, speak for one second here. I just want to thank everybody for their participation tonight. And, um, and we're going to do this again next week. We're going to talk about environmental topics. And uh, the questions are just keep rolling in here for Don. So we'll say goodbye to everybody who, uh, who doesn't care so much about roses. But for all you rose lovers, we'll keep going until... Uh, as long as they keep as long until Don walks uh, gets out of his chair and walks away, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm in I'm in my office here, so I, I'm I'm good. <laughs> okay, how about the powdery mildew issue? Is the powdery mildew of roses the same powdery mildew of peonies? Now, I, I I'm not a plant pathologist, and they they tell me that there are many 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 um, I think species of powdery mildew, many. Uh, fungus that cause that powdery mildew outbreak. But generally the control is the same, whether it's on uh, peonies or roses uh, or lilacs. Uh, so generally uh, protective fungicides, uh, look at the label to see, make sure that it uh, protects against powdery mildew. Uh, but generally um, keeping the foliage dry and putting uh, preventative type fungicides okay. should, you... should work regardless of the uh, specific uh, powdery mildew species. Yeah. Do you have any comments about bone meal? I, I'm not a fan of bone meal. Our soil, uh, bone meal, as I understand, is uh, pretty much calcium. And our soils are so plentiful in calcium that I, I'm not a, a fan of applying bone meal. I'd rather spend that dollar on a well-balanced fertilizer. How do you feel about sulfur? Oh, I, I, sulfur, I, I, I like sulfur. <laughs> there are um, some fertilizers, aluminum sulfate and different uh, that, that can, as I understand, can help um, mitigate some of the alkaline type situations in our soil. And so um, uh, myself, I don't use aluminum sulfate as a fertilizer, but I, I know of many people that have good success with that. Okay, how about... Uh... Have you ever propagated your own roses in your career as a nurseryman? You know, I, I've got a long bucket list uh, in, in <laughs> horticulture. And one of uh, the things on my bucket list is to propagate roses from cuttings. I think I'll do that this, uh, this summer. And um, so I've got to bone up on exactly the most successful ways. And so I never have. Okay, let's see here. How about it? Ever use neem oil for powdery mildew? I've used neem oil on house plants, um, but I, I have not used it on powdery mildew. I believe it's listed as a control for powdery mildew, but I, I don't know one way or the other how effective it is. Have you used that, Tom? Neem oil? Uh, yes, as a powdery I have. mildew. I've used uh, it for insects. Right. Um, you know what? I really focus on. Uh, I focus on prevent, like you said, prevention's the answer, you know, proper watering and if possible, uh, disease resistant cultivars, that really makes the huge difference, you know, good sanitation at the end of the year. Um, but I don't think, but neem oil, I guess it can have some fungicidal benefit. There's other fungicides, I guess I would, if I was desperate to save my plant, I would turn to a more conventional one. How about, uh, have you ever made, in, is this on your bucket list too about making tea from rose hips or have you done that? <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't. I have eaten rose hips uh, just because they say they're edible. So I, I've eaten rose, uh, you know, and they're delightful. And, but no, I haven't brewed them into tea. 
but I like the flavor of them. They're a little bit bitter, but you know, roses are in the apple family, so um, uh, they are edible. How about Harrison's yellow? Any experience with that? Yes, Harrison yellow is one of the good old fashioned roses. Uh, that's one that I think has been around since pioneer days. Also now Harrison yellow is a June bloomer. I don't believe it repeats. No, it does. It's a Father's Day bloomer. They, yeah. The gardeners out west tell me that they know it's Father's Day when it's Harrison when yellow. When the Harrison blooms. yellow rose blooms. You know, if you when is the best time to move roses if you have to dig them up? Spring, In fall? Early spring, early spring before they leaf out and prune back by uh, two thirds, maybe uh, get as many roots, move them with the moist peat moss around the roots. And the key is to get them before they leaf out. How do you how do you winterize a tall climbing rose? Well, that's why it's important to uh, choose like the Canadian varieties that act like climbers. Uh, people that have successfully done the tender type of climbing roses, put them on a hinge trellis that they can lay the whole works down and then cover it over with a mulch of some sort. Uh, and um, but otherwise, it's very difficult to in place uh protect a um, climbing type roses so hinge trellis lay it down and cover it over well we're just tapping you so much here from your knowledge here keep it coming how about uh, any wisdom about ever blooming floribundas just any general thoughts about the floribundas yeah floribundas are kind of cluster type roses and uh, I think the first one I ever uh, did was one called Uten, E-U-T-I-N, when I was a teenager. And that did beautifully. For, uh, and um, they're, uh, as I mentioned, a cluster type roses, uh, tender, so they do need covering over. Um, make sure after the clusters are done blossoming that you cut that back so you'll get a rebloom also. You know, with that William Baffin you mentioned, how, how tall does, does that thing get? William Baffin uh, will usually get, oh, probably eight feet, eight feet, uh, you know, no reason it probably couldn't keep going, but I guess a, a practical uh, height is probably eight feet. Uh, so if you wanted to cover an archway, uh, the best thing is to put one of those, William Baffin and Hel uh, Henry Kelsey, uh, one of those on each side of the arbor and let them go up because in the course of a season, then it'll reach the midpoint. Do you recommend John Cabot climbing rose? Yeah, John Cabot, yes. That's another in that series. Uh, William Baffin, um, Henry Kelsey, John Cabot is another Canadian uh, rose that acts like a climber. Uh, it does need to have the canes fastened to the trellis. How about if this person has a south facing stucco wall? Is that too hot for roses? Well, if you want to grow a rose in that location, the sun will be good, but make sure you mulch the uh, mulch the soil very good, very well, and uh, at least five or six inches of mulch. Odds, um, you know, odds are that that's a very hot location, so the rose isn't going to like the heat, but you can mitigate that by keeping the soil cool. Okay, last one, Don. How about a personal question about someone knows that you grew a Morden Bell? Have you ever heard of that? Morden Bell? Yeah, Morden Bell is in that series. Uh, let's see, Morden Bell. Let's see, I don't have it now. We uh, we moved, uh, uh, what, five years ago? And Morden Bell was one of the ones that I did not take along. We couldn't take everything. That one was too old. Uh, Morden Bell is a pretty, it's again in that Morden series. What you know, not the best that? disease. Uh, let's see, Morden Bell was pink. Is that right? Um, and I think it was a deeper pink. Uh, now the Morden series is wonderful. Uh, you know, you do have to keep an eye on the uh, foliage uh, for disease. Okay, Don, you deserve a break. Thank you for your great talk tonight. Mm -hmm.